Amen. Let's say the benediction and go home. What do you think? <laughs> what a wonderful, uh, beautiful song, inspirational song, blesses and encourages our hearts. And now we come to a challenging text of scripture. We are continuing through the Sermon on the Mount as we continue thinking about becoming God's person, listening to the teachings of Jesus, and we are up to chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Everything Jesus has said so far is challenging to us. These words even take it a step further. These are challenging words for us to apply to our lives. So I invite you this morning to hear... Jesus, as he continues to teach us in the Sermon on the Mount about becoming God's person, this morning we think about becoming a judgment-free person. Our text for today is Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Hear now the words of Jesus. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be used to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother or sister's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or your sister, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother or sister's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this challenging word this morning. When Jesus spoke these words, he did as he has done all the way through the Sermon on the Mount. He uses words, he uses phrases, he uses ideas and concepts and even mental pictures that were easy for his listeners to understand. This warning that Jesus offers here against judging other people, it was a very common warning in Jesus' day. The rabbis of Jesus' day often talked about the need to not judge someone else. The rabbis were often heard teaching and saying things like, the one who judges his, a neighbor favorably will be judged favorably by God. And many, many other teachings on this theme. In fact, the rabbis taught that there were six great works that brought a person credit in this world and gave the person profit in the world to come. Quickly, those six things were studying, visiting the sick, hospitality, devotion and prayer, educating children in the faith, and here it is, the last one, number six, thinking the best of other people, not judging them. Basically, becoming a judgment-free person was a sacred duty and responsibility in the time of Jesus. It was part of the culture. Well, it's not much different for us today especially in the south, in the southern part of the United States. In our culture, we consider it to be important to be a nice person. That's a value in our culture. We can debate to whether it's still as highly held as it has been in the past, but in our culture, it's important, it's highly valued to be nice. Now, of course, sometimes we also value gossip. We also value talking negatively about someone, usually behind the person's back. But in our society, when you're in public, when you're talking face-to-face with another person, it's important to be nice. 
Many of our mothers taught us, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all, right? Amen. That's right. Yes. We can always amen our mothers. So in that context, in that context, we might think that this teaching from Jesus, well, it should be fairly easy, right? It's part of our culture. It's part of how we consider things should be and how, something that we highly value, that we should be nice. And listen, we know, we know the pain and the hurt that can come when we are misjudged. The truth is that people are often guilty of incredible misjudgments. In fact... Probably everyone in this room at some point in his or her life has suffered the effects of someone misjudging us. And we know that that can be hurtful. It can be painful when someone else misjudges us. We know all of these things, and we know it's part of our culture to be nice, and yet I would submit to you this morning that there is hardly any teaching of Jesus... In all of his teachings, there is hardly any teaching of Jesus that is more consistently broken or neglected than these words about our need to not judge other people. William Barclay, a New Testament scholar, has read and studied these words from Jesus about judgment. And he says... As I listen to what Jesus says and I think about what he implies in his teachings, there are at least three inherent reasons, Barclay says, that Jesus says we should not judge other people. This morning I want to share with you in my own words what William Barclay says are implied in these words of three great reasons why we should never judge someone else. First, we never know all the facts or the whole person. We never know all of the facts. We never know everything about certain situations, and we also don't know the whole person. Long ago, Hillel, a well-known rabbi, said, this was his quote, Do not judge someone else until you yourself have come into his or her circumstances or situation. It's very similar to that saying that we know, don't judge someone else until you walk a mile in his or her shoes, right? Hillel was saying, we cannot know what someone else is going through. We can't know the strength of their temptations. We can't know the difficulties someone else is facing. So we're not in a position to judge that person. Someone with an even, calm temperament has a hard time understanding the person whose passions and anger are raised up very quickly and strongly. A person who was brought up in a good home or in a Christian surrounding has a difficult time understanding the circumstances or the perspectives of someone who grew up with constant abuse or even neglect. I don't know what it's like to grow up in a home with an abusive father or an alcoholic mother. I don't know what it's like to be addicted to opioids. I have never been homeless. I have a hard time understanding what people go through on a daily basis whose experiences are very different from mine. And I would say this morning that if we actually could walk in someone else's shoes, and if we actually could see life and experience life from their perspective, instead of judging them, we might find ourselves amazed that they do as well as they do. But we not only don't know all the facts. As I said, we don't know the whole person. We only see part of people. We only see a perspective of a person from our vantage point. We can't see the whole person. I read not too long ago about a crystal. It's a type of crystal. It's called a Labrador spar. I don't know anything about this crystal, but I read about it. And as I understand it, if you pick up a Labrador spar crystal, when you look at it, it seems dull. 
it seems to be without any kind of luster or brilliance. It doesn't seem to be a fascinating crystal at all. But if you hold that crystal up and if you turn it and you keep turning it and keep twisting it until the light hits it at just the right angle, then all of a sudden you see in this Labrador Spar crystal this brilliance that you couldn't see from any other angle or any other perspective. People are like that, aren't they? We only see them from one perspective. We only see small aspects of people. We only see them from certain angles. And because we know very little about them, they may appear to be harsh or cold or mean or indifferent or on and on negative traits, we could say. But the reality just might be we just haven't seen that person from the right angle. In the very first church that I pastored, first full-time church I pastored, there was a man who sat on the very back row every Sunday. He was there almost every single Sunday, and he sat with his arms crossed like this and a scowl on his face through the whole service. Unfortunately for me, he also came every Wednesday night, and he <laughs> sat in the same place with the same arms crossed and the same scowl on his face. He was a difficult man to enjoy being around. I remember I would be preaching at times, and if I happened to catch his eye, sometimes as I was preaching, he was shaking his head like this. <laughs> a couple of times, I think I even saw him rolling his eyes when I was preaching. And there were a couple of Wednesday nights, I remember very clearly, I was in the middle of teaching, and he would just blurt out, where did you come up with that? <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't care for him very much. But slowly, I got to know this man. I got to learn about him. I learned that he had gone through a very tough upbringing. Life had been hard on him. He had some deep-seated pains. He had some heartaches that haunted him on a daily basis. He had been brought up in a very strict, stern, rough manner. He, he was kind of like a Labrador spar. See, it, you had to twist and turn and see him from the right angle to see him sparkle. The longer we were at the church, the more I began to see his sparkle. God gave me the right angle to get to know him from, and he became a dear friend to me and to our family. In fact, a few years later, we had moved on to another community and were pastoring another church, and we were traveling back through that community, and in our brief travel back through this community, we only had time to stop and see one person, one family, and yes, he was the man that we stopped to see. Sometimes we miss the sparkle in other people because we only see a small part of who they are. We only see them from the wrong perspective. Jesus was teaching us here that we are not to condemn other people because we only see a small part of them. Don't judge a person based on the small bits that you see. Instead, look for the angle to see the brilliance, to see the image of God inside that person. That's what we want people to do with us, right? Think about this. What if the only thing people knew about you were how you looked and responded the first two minutes you get out of bed in the morning? What if that's the only thing somebody knew about you? Now, maybe you jump up and you're in a happy mood, but a lot of us aren't. That would not be a fair way to judge us, would it? One reason we must not judge is because we don't know the whole facts. We don't know the whole person. A second reason William Barclay says is we should, that Jesus says we should not judge someone else because we cannot be impartial. It's not possible for us to look beyond our prejudices, our biases. We are swayed swayed by our instinctive and often unreasonable reactions to other people. History tells us that there was a period in Greek culture when the Greeks decided to hold all their trials in the dark. 
in the dark. They would hold their trials, and it seemed strange, but there was a very good reason for it. That way the judge, that way the jury, or whoever was to evaluate the situation, would not see the person who was on trial and would in no way be influenced by anything other than the facts of the case. They didn't want prejudices coming in, only the facts. That happens all the time in our world, doesn't it? We are influenced by things like appearance, size, race, gender, wealth, poverty, education, on and on and on we could go. We are prejudiced. In other words, we prejudge people based on a variety of first impressions, and often those first impressions have little if nothing to do with who that person is and how he or she actually lives. Part of what Jesus is saying is the only person who really has the right to judge another person is someone who could be completely impartial. And because we cannot be completely impartial, we therefore have no right to judge another person. Jesus says, judge not. In other words, do not judge because you don't have the right and you cannot be impartial. But finally, thirdly, William Barclay says, Jesus himself gives us the supreme reason that we are not to judge others. No person is good enough to judge another human being. No person is good enough to judge another human being. Jesus painted a vivid picture for his listeners. It's one of my favorite mental pictures in all of Scripture. It's the picture of a person with a huge beam protruding protruding from his or her eye, looking into the eye of another person trying to find a tiny speck. Imagine a cartoon drawing. The person has a huge beam. The actual literal Greek word is the primary structural beam of a house. A huge beam protruding from the person's eye. And all the time, that person is looking into the eye of another trying to find the tiniest speck. It's completely absurd. And it's meant to be absurd. And the sad thing is it happens all the time. It happens every time we judge another person. The point is very clear. Only the faultless person has the right to look for faults in another person. You remember John chapter 8 when Jesus is there with this woman who is accused of adultery. All the men are ready to stone her and what does Jesus say? The person who is without sin should cast the first stone. William Barclay says one way to think about Jesus' message here is to realize that no person has the right to judge or criticize another person unless he or she, the person judging or criticizing, is prepared at the very least to do the thing they are criticizing that person for even better themselves. Wow. How might that change our families? How might that change our churches? Just think if we took that statement seriously. Basically, no one should say anything negative or critical about someone else unless he or she was willing to spend time themselves trying to make that situation better. Barclay is saying, don't complain about what someone else is or isn't doing unless you yourself are willing to take that responsibility and do it better yourself. That would change so much. Let's be honest, there are so many people, there are many Christians who criticize this, that, and the other, but often those same Christians are not willing to take on the responsibilities of doing something themselves. I read a quote this week. The world is full of people who claim the right to be extremely vocal in criticism and extremely exempt from action. 
That statement is right in line with what Jesus is teaching in this passage. Jesus wants us to know that no person, no Christian, has the right to judge or criticize other people unless they are willing to do something themselves to make that situation better. No person, Jesus says, is good enough to criticize or judge a fellow human being in that way. When we think about what Jesus is saying, it's challenging, but really, it comes down to something very simple. Why shouldn't we judge other people? Well, according to Jesus, we don't know all the facts. We don't know the whole person. It's impossible for us to judge because we can't be impartial. We have biases and prejudices that skew our perspectives, and ultimately, We can't judge someone else because we ourselves are not good enough to judge anyone except ourselves. The honest truth is every one of us has quite enough to do to make things right in our own lives without wasting our time and wasting our lives trying to condemn and judge the lives of of those around us. I believe if Jesus could sum up this teaching in one statement, maybe he would say something like this. Each one of you would do well to concentrate on your own faults and leave the faults of other people to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, this is a challenging word. It is a word that is hard for all of us as Christians to live up to. But we know it is what you expect from us. And we know it is what you want from those who claim to be your followers. So Lord, give us courage. Give us strength. Give us the willingness to judge only the person we see in the mirror and to see everyone else with the grace that you give to us. Lead us and guide us in these ways for we pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.